<laughs> I'm just gonna stop it. <laughs> that was that, that was very ill-conceived and badly prepared by me. So, <laughs> welcome everybody to the Spotlight on the Multiverse Going to Now show. Uh, I am here with only one person tonight, and it's the person that I wanted to spend an hour with so much. So I'm really excited to have her, the awesome Misty Massey here. Uh, Misty, tell everybody a little bit about yourself so that we can. Uh, erase the memory of the last 30 seconds and just go right into talking for an hour. Okay. Um, I'm Misty Massey. I'm the author of the Mad Kestrel series of pirate fantasy adventures. I am an editor for Falstaff Books, Mocha Memoirs Press, Lore Seekers Press, and occasionally I uh, edit for uh for just people who need an editor. And um, when I'm not doing all that wordy stuff, I, uh, <laughs> I know, right? When is that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm also a cast member on the Authors and Dragons podcast. I was for, I think, two years, I played Malibu, the sun-drenched cleric on the, on the Calamity Jane's show on authors and dragons and right now i am playing and we're crow the seductive <laughs> sly slinky thief who wants to get in your pockets or your pants he's not particular which and uh, and it's on our new game quest for competence but that's also on the authors and dragons podcast which you can find by going to authors and dragons.com so nice hi anita hi vanessa nice to see you both here hey, that's awesome uh you know, we 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 talked before about multiverse a little bit, but let's rehash it a little bit for people who didn't get the opportunity to see it before. Uh, sure. What are you looking for most forward to this year at multiverse? What what is it about multiverse that that keeps you wanting to go to it? You know, I I just like the attitude at multiverse. It's it's the it feels the way cons used to feel when we were all just there to adore each other and have fun and um and so i i love the i love the camaraderie and and the the friendship that i feel at multiverse um i you know i'm i'm going to be completely honest here i am fangirling like a crazy person <laughs> because i want to say hello to rebecca roanhorse because <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm such a fan. So I was very excited that I was able to be invited back this year because, you know, for many reasons, because I love everybody that I met last time I was there, but also because Rebecca Runhorse is going to be there. Maybe she can sign my book. <laughs> so, um, you know, but yeah, because I'm, I'm one of those people too. I am a total fangirl about, so uh, there are a bunch of writers that I will, um, my very favorite writer is Tim Powers. And uh, I got to meet him one time in person at a con in North Carolina. And it mm. took me most of the first day to get up the nerve to actually say hello. And uh, John Hartness will tell the story because he was there. And he says that my <laughs> voice was like three decibels high. <laughs> so I'm fairly certain that I'm going to pull something similar when I meet Rebecca Roanhorse and manage, you know, hello, I love you, sign my book, and that'll be about it. But that's okay. <laughs> but I'm very excited anyway. And Who knows? Um, you, might, you might even get put on a panel with her. Would that not be like the greatest thing ever? That would be really cool. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that at all. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, your your prominent presence on panels in, in past conventions and multiverse, especially too. And I, 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 I kind of give us an give us a thought about panels. What 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 do you like about them? What do you like about the multiverse panels versus you know other convention panels? What do you think about paneling in general is is that something that you think is an essential tool for an author i think they can be very helpful um as long as the uh, the con runners that are creating the panels create panels that are actually timely mm -hmm. and um and are touching on what writers are facing right now um you know, I'll go ahead and say it. There's there's a panel that I really hate, and and it's going to sound terrible when I first say it, but hear me out. Um, I really don't like the strong writing strong women mm. panel, and one gets put on every con I go to. It seems they come up with these writing strong women, 
And the reason that I don't like it is not because I don't want to write about strong women because, you know, Mad Kestrel, female pirate. So yeah. <laughs> I, I'm totally into into reading about and writing about strong women. But the problem with the panel is that it always ends up being um, being sort of a fan fest. Um, let's talk mm -hmm. about, you know, here I liked this book. I like that book. And it really doesn't touch on what makes the the characters stand out. And so. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer when when the panel is is made is made tighter, and um, and the topic is not so broad as writing strong women. But um, you know how do how do we make sure that that female characters aren't just male characters with dresses on or something like that? Mm -hmm. You know, make it tighter and then it works. But so I just I don't care for broad uh, panels all that much because they. They, it's so easy to go off the rails and yeah. in a direction that it really didn't need to go in the first place. But when the when the panels are are about some timely subject or about something that writers struggle with, I'm all about it. I'm totally there. Nice. Yeah, I uh, I agree with you. I I I find too that those panels are poorly more poorly attended every time I see them than than. Uh, direct specific panels are, you know, if you're, if you're too generic, I think people are confused by that as well too, in a lot of respects, because they just don't know how to feel about it. Well, what are they going to really touch on? Is it going to be something that's going to be important to me or not? You know? And I think that the more specific you can get, the more, uh, the more interaction you will have on the panel and the more interest I think you will have as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So and 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 you're right. It does. People look at the program and go, "What is that about?" I yeah. don't know what that's about because it's too broad. And so, I'll, I I spent um, a good number of years as the writing track director for Con Carolinas in Charlotte, and uh, so your girl knows knows <laughs> from panel building. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, I find it entertaining and I love to, sometimes I will just sit down and look at other cons uh, programming and steal topics and mm -hmm. go, I'm sticking this on a, on a folder for later because I love this topic. And that way I have something to pull from when it's my turn to actually come up with, with ideas. But, um, but yeah, I, I love creating panels. I think it's fun. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, you know, you really don't have to, to just do the kind of broad generic thing you can get tight and, uh, and see, that's something that multiverse does really well. Yes. They, they come up with very specific panels that are very timely and are very important and, and, and nothing's just here. Let's just stick one in. Cause we've got yep. an hour to fill. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it becomes very interactive at Multiverse, too, which I really appreciate. That's the one thing about Multiverse, I think, that has been unique in my experiences on panels uh, and uh, sitting there in the audience is you feel like you're a part of the panel, not just being talked to, you know. Sure. There's a lot There's a lot of those times when you feel like that. And there you go. Vanessa says, if there was only someone to make that happen, you and Rebecca on the panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then she also puts a really good point here i really dislike when there's a clever panel title i was going to mention this because yeah i think we, i did uh, so at con carolinas this year i did um, a panel uh, about kevin smith and uh it was it was the view askew verse was the name of the, the title of the panel and we talked a lot about it and okay. it wasn't one of those that was this misleading but i think a lot of people didn't get it right off the bat and and so i think that's kind of I think you have to, I think title, titling your panel has to be more direct as, uh, you know, uh, too. I don't think it's nice to have a clever title, but sometimes those can do a disservice to you as well. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm really, I'm guilty of coming up with this, the brilliantly clever title and then looking <laughs> back and going, okay, nobody's going to have a clue what I am going on about, but wow, yeah. was I brilliant for a second. Okay. And, and, you know, and then fix it because, because <laughs> if like, I'm yeah. not even sure what I meant, nobody else is going to know either. Yeah. And Vanessa puts up another good point, which is if the title is clever, make the description clear. Yeah, I agree. Yes. I, think, I think, yeah, if you can just tell people what it is, that, that makes a lot of sense. But, Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. And, and then, you know, you're going to, be are you vending this year at multiverse i think we talked about that last time i don't remember if you were. i 
I just got an email um, three days ago that I have qualified for a table. Yeah, yeah nice. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be sharing my table with Alexandra Christian. Oh, and nice. um, she's a good friend of mine. We're in a writing group together. And so we will be completely silly and obnoxious at our table. And we will be yelling at people to come and look at what we have to sell. So don't be surprised if we if we are flirty and silly and, and calling <laughs> out for people to come over to see what we've got but yeah I'm, I'm very excited i will have a table this year so i will definitely run by and say hello <laughs> yep, please uh, do. I, I will be pseudo tabling i have a friend of mine uh, a, a colleague who works here with go with me at go with me now who has a table for her author stuff and she's graciously approved a little corner that i can put some go Indie now swag on so i will awesome. have that there yeah um Vanessa says Alexandria is so fun. <laughs> she is the doll. There you go. So Vanessa says I tabled for with her for one hour. It's how she met Con Carolina. So, yeah, I am. Um, is, is there a different approach you take at Multiverse than than any other vending, or is it the same experience for you all the time in terms of vending? It's pretty much the same. Um, I've been I've been doing this for a minute, and yeah. so I've kind of got a, a a bit of a routine down. Um, uh, although, again, uh, John Hartness has taught me a lot about mm -hmm. uh, effective selling. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, I I never used to to get into somebody. I never used to cross the the plane of the table. And now, if somebody comes up and looks even the least little bit interested, I will pick up a book and go here and put it in their hand, make them take it. And, um, and half the time, if they're touching it, they'll go ahead and buy it. And so, and that was something John taught me to do. Now I am not one who can yell, come buy my shit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like he does. That's yeah. not quite me, but, um, but I will, I will flirt a little bit and, um, and be, come on, come on. My books won't bite. It's okay. And that kind of very Southern lady kind of flirting and um, try to get people to come over to the table and then I'll put it in their hands and then go, okay, here he is. And I will also bring candy to the table a lot. Cause I find there that candy go. attracts people too. <laughs> That'll be gone by day one. <laughs> and, and that's fine. Cause I do not want to bring it home. <laughs> yeah. That's the goal, right? Bring less home. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. I I brought some home from a con once and it just sat there in my pantry and I was going, oh. please stop because it was singing my name. I'm like, no, no, go away, Candy, go away. <laughs> evil Candy. <laughs> it is evil, naughty Candy. <laughs> All right. So let's let's talk about these books you're going to sell because, okay. you know, you have this wonderful series. Uh, are, you're pretty close. Are you you're close to the third book right now. Is that right? Fourth book. I am oh, working guys. on the third book. It's mm -hmm. I'm not close to the end yet, but mm -hmm. I am working on it. Um, I have, I have it basically outlined, which is, is good. I, I, I didn't learn how to outline until after the first book. And after I did learn to outline, it was like, really, I could have been working from a map, but no, <laughs> <laughs> so, and that was David Coe that taught me oh, how, nice. how important um, map, outlining is. And, and it's not, when I say outline, it's not like you learned in school where Roman numeral one, this, right, and right. capital A, this, it's just, it's more of a messy handwritten page of nonsense with arrows going, oh, wait, this goes here and then scribble this out and, <laughs> and, um, oh, oh, see page two and that kind of thing. And nobody else could look at it and understand it, but I can. And so yeah. as long as I know what I, what my map means, then it's fine, but it helps a lot. And so I have my, my outliney mappy thing all set for book three, except for the ending. I'm still not quite sure about my ending yet. I'm, I'm working on that, but that's okay. Cause I'm not there yet. <laughs> and uh, Yeah. Vanessa, it, it's crazy. Um, yeah. But, I was... uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, um, I was just going to say um, I am working on book three and uh, I'm hoping to have it ready sometime first of next year. So nice. we'll see. I was mentioning to you off camera that I was working on a novella and this is my outline. As you can see, it's been through quite a bit. So <laughs> this is actually this is 
if you know if somebody was to carefully zoom in right now they would see the, the entire plot of the story as as i've plotted it out this is this is this is from my screenwriting days i usually just do like one sentence about the the the, the what whatever the key point is and and then you know that's how it goes <laughs> for that's me. hilarious because i i get it i totally get that that's what mine looks like too so, <laughs> except mine are still in a notebook because i yeah, have, yeah. I have usually mine are too but i had I, I had the urge i was i was at work and i have these little yellow pads at work and i had the urge just to write it all down once so that's gotcha. what i did and i and of course i didn't want to bring my whole work uh, pad home so I just ripped it off and yeah then it took took a turn of, or pocket. two in my pocket <laughs> <laughs> I can still read it but of course I already know the story too so yeah and it, and it's funny I don't know if you go through this uh, this might be something uh, I, I'm alone in but as I write and I, I start to edit and I realize because this is not edited at all I realize that certain things don't work certain ways and i'm rewriting it anyway so it doesn't always follow this is more of a very very rough guideline or outline than anything and i and i tend to just let the the fingers do the do the talking for me a little bit and and go wherever it's going to take me and and i realized oh. halfway through that okay this is not even close to the outline <laughs> oh totally oh yeah absolutely i'll look back sometimes at my outline and go oh Oops, I didn't do this and this and this and I meant to. Well, okay, then go in another book. So, yeah. you know. That's the beauty of a series though, right? So it is. It is. <laughs> so so tell everybody about the Mad Kestrel series. Give us an outline or overview of what it's about and who it follows and and everything of you know that's encompassing going from the books book one and two to into three that is going to be out next year. Okay. Um, in Mad Kestrel, the first book, Kestrel is the second in command on a pirate ship. And uh, she is uh, she is suspicious of a, a man on a different ship that she sees in a, on a stormy night. She sees him across the waves and, um, and she's very suspicious of him because he looks like he might be um, a magic user. And mm -hmm. in her world, they're called the Danisobans. And uh, the Danisobans will, they take everybody that has magic ability and lock them away in their enclave and don't let them out. And you're, you're stuck as a Danisoban for the rest of your life. Well, secretly, Kestrel has magic ability and she doesn't tell anybody because she loves being a pirate. She loves being on the ocean. And so the only person that knows is her captain. Well, they go to they they go to an island called El Draga to sell the goods that they've plundered and to to take a little break. And they run into this this guy, Philip McCavery, and um, he and he and the captain seem to be friends, but Kestrel's still suspicious of him, and rightly so because the next morning her captain is abducted, and mm. it it appears that McCavery has stolen her ship. And so she has to go chasing after him to try to, to, she wants to chase after him, to capture him, to take him back, to turn in so she can get her captain free. And it all ends up uh, being not at all what she thought was going on. And, um, and uh, she ends up having to use her magic to, to work to save her captain. And it's the one thing she never wanted to do was reveal it, but it's the only way that she can save him. So she does have to use her magic. Um, in book two, she has, uh, I'll go ahead and say it. She, she has saved her captain. <laughs> and, um, but um, he, uh, she is now the captain of her own ship and she uh, is out um, sailing around and she's heading somewhere on a secret mission that the King has set her. And on the way she meets a woman who is uh, mysteriously much more well-versed in the magic that Kestrel can do than Kestrel herself. And she wants to, to get this woman to teach her, but along the way, certain things uh, end up causing her a lot of problems and she may end up killing herself in, in the process of learning her magic before, it's, before she can find a way to control it. So mm. um, that's book two. And then in book three, uh, 
I don't want to tell you in book three. <laughs> no, no, please, yeah. Let's, let's yeah. keep it under wraps. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not ready to tell yet. So. Right. I, you know, the interesting thing about that journey to me is finding ways in which Kestrel kind of absorbs magic, right? That, 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 that she's drawn to it and that like mm -hmm. she finds these people who are like her or use magic that she, I, I you know, in, 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 in developing that kind of thing, it, it, was there kind of this thought that the, that the, there, there had to be an instinctual aspect to that, uh, to that journey for her. Do, do you, it, because obviously also suppressing her magic probably doesn't teach her a whole lot about herself. Right. And so do you feel like, that's kind of the way to kind of get her to learn more about who she is by discovering others. And, and is was that kind of the thought process behind how she was discovering all these people using magic or was well, it just happenstance? Um, a little of both really. Um, mm -hmm. She, she was an orphan. She was a street child. Um, when she was four, her parents were, when she was four, the Denisovans showed up having learned that she was what they call a promise, a child with magic ability. And they came to claim her and her parents wouldn't let them take her. And the, the Denisovans ended up fighting with the parents and killing them. But the mother had, had arranged a way for Kestrel to, she had a little, um, a little trap door in their house. And so she pushed Kestrel through the trap door under their little shack that they lived in and told her to run. Mm -hmm. And so Kestrel ran and she ended up living on the streets uh, with the other street kids for until she was actually grown up and um, found a job with a madam who, you know, ran a, ran a pleasure house <laughs> and uh, she wasn't being, she wasn't being um, a prostitute. She was, she was working in the gaming area and serving drinks. And mm -hmm. so uh, she, and that's how she met her captain and finally was able to go to sea. And the thing about Kestrel's magic and the reason that the Danisobans wanted to lay hands on her was because the Danisobans cannot work their magic near salt water. Mm -hmm. So they don't take ships anywhere unless it's absolutely vital. And there are very specific precautions they have to take to get on a ship at all. And um, they, if really, if you're, if you're prepared for it, you can defeat a Denisovan or at least distract them really well by throwing a bucket of seawater at them. Um, that doesn't work on Kestrel. She is not limited by being close to the ocean. And so that's why being on a ship was safe for her and allowed her to not delve into her magic for a long time. Because to her, magic is something that gets you killed, or it was at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. And so she didn't want to learn because learning magic just equals somebody else you love dying. And so she didn't want to do that. Um, but like I said, in the first book, the only thing she, the only skill she had that could really save her captain was her magic. And she had to figure out a lot of it completely on her own because she had nobody to teach her. Mm. And, uh, so, so that was fun. That was a lot of fun working from that point of view. And, um, and it was hard because I knew how the magic worked, but of course she didn't. Mm -hmm. And there was nobody to teach her. And so I had to be very careful in writing the book and not let her just know too much because it's not magic's not the kind of thing that you just go, wake up one day and go, oh, I can do magic. And it works like this. You know, I had to build the magic system, but then I had to keep it a secret myself. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and for people who don't know, you're you're an editor as well. You, you do a lot of editing and so for you, you know, putting together the magic system was was the rules very did you you have finited all the rules? You've, you've gone to a, a degree of detail with them. Or do you feel and is that you feel like that's an important aspect of, of creating a magic world is finding rules that will fit within that system to kind of make it work? Or do you feel like there is a bit of discovery still with with writing magic that you can you can utilize in terms of you know maybe this rule 
can be bent or, you know, something to that effect. Absolutely. There are, like I said, she, she doesn't, she's not affected by the salt water the way the Denisovans are. And so there are going to be a lot of rules that she continues to learn as she goes because she's different and there's, you know, and there's nobody really handy to tell her every single thing. Um, so, so while I have certain rules in place for my magic system, um, I want it to make sense when, when things happen, I don't want to just go and then magic happened and yeah. because that's very unsatisfying. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so, um, so I try to make it, make everything follow the rules that I've set down. But at the same time, if I need, I need her to have another ability or, or I need something else to happen and it needs to be through magic. I'm going to make sure that, that it can at least, um, it, it can at least slot in with a uh, reasonable uh, grace and, and, and ease so that, uh, so that people aren't going, wait a minute. I, I thought, I thought spinning sand was, was a bad thing. And yet she's spinning sand on the beach. Not, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. I want to be very careful. So. Yeah. That's so, so there's, it, there's, there's a little bit of exposition to kind of explain th those aspects of it that I would imagine. Yeah. Well, usually, um, usually it's other characters. Uh, in the second book, the woman that she meets, like I said, knows a lot more about her magic. And so there is some training finally going on in the second book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that helped a lot. It's, um, they're also, they're also in a hurry again. Um, it's, it's a bit of a chase. And so yeah. there are not going to be these long training montages, but at the same time, um, she's having to learn on the, on the run with this, this woman who may or may not be able to train her and they're just doing little bits at a time. So. Yeah, so give me a little rope here. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm making a little bit of an assertion here in the aspect of we just talked about, you know, certain subject matter being a little bit off putting for you in terms of like strong female characters, but we all know that on a ship, no matter, no matter what gender you are or what personality you are, there has to be a very strong arm. There has to, you have to have a thick skin. You have to be very, very tough to make it on a ship because there's so many things that could go wrong. There's so many things that happen that, that there's just a lot of, bravado there's a lot of testosterone there's a lot of a lot of that out there so does the magic help kind of salt uh, uh, to, not to not to be so coy with my words here but kind of play a little bit for you to give her that vulnerability that that femininity that maybe would be lacking if we were just watching her be on her ship um yeah, I think so. I think yeah, because she's having to keep it such a secret, mm -hmm. and uh, it. it well, she doesn't know how it works, right? So yeah, she doesn't know how it works. It would be much the same as in as with historical pirates, uh, like um, Anne Bonny and Mary Read, who mm -hmm. who dressed as men and presented as men because that was the the safer way to be in in that in that society. Um, than than saying here I am just a girly little girl on a ship and and making themselves look vulnerable they they dress themselves up as men to to protect themselves and um and so Kestrel yeah her her magic is her her less her more vulnerable side mm -hmm. and so she does keep it um, a secret um in in Mad Kestrel the first book uh, there is a scene where um some of the crew decide that this just isn't going to work. They're not going to work for a woman and yeah. they don't care what her goals are. They're not going to do this. And cause she's just a girl. And um, I, she ends up having to, to deal with one of the mutineers, the, the main one to, as a, as a way to, to um, make sure that the rest understand that she will, she will take no quarter. And uh, the original way that I wrote it, um, I had, I, uh, I had her hang him and I described Whoa. the hanging very, um, very uh, clearly. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, with, 
purpling face and tongue sticking out and all that stuff. And uh, my editor came back and he said, yeah, no, this isn't going to work. I said, but it's a really good scene. He said, oh, you can do away with the guy. Just make it a little bit easier to read because this is kind of creepy and verging on horror. And I said, all yeah. right, fine. <laughs> So I was disappointed. I had to, I had to change that one, but you know, that that's what the editor does. They know yeah. what the readers will respond to. And, and he was right. I'm sure that, that, uh, that's the scene needed to be a little less uh, grotesque, mm -hmm. but, but it was kind of fun being able to write that and, and have the Kestrel that's inside me punish that guy for, for not <laughs> being, not being a good team player. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I love that. It, 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 it's almost it, it, it's it's sad that that's a necessary scene, but it is kind of the way of the how this went. You know, and it kind of leads into Vanessa's question, which uh, she she asks, "How did you go about organizing your research as you were learning about ships, pirates, etc.?" She says, "I struggle with that part, so I'm always looking to see how others do it." Books and post-it notes. I have I had post-it notes sticking out of lots of books of different all of my pirate books are in a little um, bookcase over here next to my desk. And um, for a while I had uh, post-it notes just sticking out everywhere. They looked like little like um, little cactuses made of post-it notes <laughs> because I'd go, oh, this is really good. Yeah, I need to remember this. And, oh, this is what I need here. And they so I'd have them sticking out of the top and sticking out of the side. But to remember that there was something in that book that I wanted to remember. So, uh, but I, I tend to, uh, I, I, I bought a, an awful lot of, of piratey resource books because I just found that trying to get them from the library I, and I love the library. I'm a, I'm at the library every week, but, um, but trying to get them from the library uh, is limited because I do have to eventually give them back. They're funny yeah. about that sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I ended up buying an awful lot of the books that I used and, um, and marking them and, and uh, making sure that I knew what I needed. And, and I have some, I actually have some children's books too. I, I have a children's book that is, oh, I don't know, it's like yay big. It's huge. And if you open it up, it's, it's got cross sections of the inside of ships. Oh, cool. And I use that book all the time. Cause I'll be like, wait a minute, what, which level of the ship are we on? Okay. All right. Okay. We're on this page. Oh shoot. She's got to go up three staircases before she's on the deck, you know? <laughs> so, and that helps a lot, even though it's a children's book, it was really useful. So. Yeah. yeah. Seafaring research. Oh yeah. A used bookstore. But uh, yeah, I mean, what, what, what era is, is this the golden era of pirating that you, that you place your stories in? Well, no, because it is a it is a fantasy world. Mm. So they're like the golden age pirates of our world, but everything's not the same. The rules okay. are still somewhat different, and um, and of course the the world is different. We're not on Earth, so um, the main the main area that they live in are the nine islands, and um, most of them are inhabited. A couple of them are not, but they're still part of the archipelago anyway. So, um, and there's another, the continent with a big C is way off in that direction. And people rarely go there because it's a really long way. So, but, um, oh, I'm very jealous. I would love to go on a tall ship someday. And in fact, people talk about, oh, let's go, let's do a cruise. Let's do a cruise. And I really, really, really want to do like a windjammer cruise. Mm. because they're they're more like a, a tall ship I, and yeah. um yeah and you're close to the water and you can hear the sails and all that so mm. i would love to go on a tall ship just for for research <laughs> so, <laughs> but it would be, it would really be research so <laughs> at least after at least during at least during the first two pina coladas and then after you know who knows maybe <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's, I mean, yeah, the, uh, you find that there, there is a certain expectation with pirate books in terms of the time periods and, and things like that, uh, you know, creating a world for that. I mean, is that, is that something you really enjoy? Do you, are you a big world builder? You like the aspects of creating a world and how deeply detailed is your world for you? 
Um, it's it's pretty detailed. I know what happens on all of my islands. I I drew a map years ago that I it's not in my books. I probably should put it in one of the books, I guess, eventually. But um, but I, I drew a map long ago before I was ever published, and mm -hmm. and I figured out which uh, how the the how the currents went around each island so that I would know how long it took to sail from one place to another. And, and I figured out the distances and I figured out what kind of, of um, beach areas and stuff that, that each island had and which one was just rocks and, and which ones were big enough that they could, they could farm and all that kind of stuff. So, so I, I know, I know a lot more about my islands than ever gets into the, into the books because you know you don't want to go and and then on 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 uh, <laughs> yeah. on Draga, you know <laughs> it's like no no not everything is exciting right I mean right you know, yeah <laughs> like I've I've got I've got two <laughs> islands that sit next to each other with a channel in between and one raises uh raises grapes to to make wine and the other oh. one raises vegetables. And so they're, they're considered the farming islands and, um, and, but nobody wants to hear about that. That's boring. So. <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe, a, maybe on a blog or something like that, maybe, maybe, they, it, you know, yeah, but yeah, I, I, I hear you. It's, 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 it's tough. And I would imagine a lot of those post-it notes too, don't get as used as you'd hope they would be too. Oh no. Yeah. Oh no. There's a lot more that, that I never used that would have been fun to try to throw in, but it just didn't fit. So, yeah. 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 It, so I'm, I, I'm curious, what is your favorite thing that you didn't know about pirates going into writing this series that you've now discovered that you really love? Um, how very democratic uh, pirate culture was. Um, I had no idea when, when I was when I was a kid, I grew up in the low country of South Carolina. And so pirates down there are are sort of outlaw hero kind of people. They're, you know, everybody thinks that pirates are cool and down there. And so um so I knew a lot about pirates from from my my preteen years on up, but I never knew until I started researching that pirate crews were allowed to vote on their captain. And if the mm -hmm. captain had not pleased them or had not made them enough money, they could vote his tail off that ship or, or just demote him and put somebody else in his place. And uh, I, I thought that was interesting that, that the first real democracies were actually on pirate ships. So I, I thought cool. that was always fun. Yeah. That's neat. And, and, by by uh, removing him, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be sitting in Davy Jones' locker, right? He's in, it's yeah. Not a, he just yeah, he could leave. just be demoted, and you know, okay, now you've got to go serve on the gun crew, and we're putting this guy in. You know, he's yeah. going to do better for us, and so that's just interesting. So, uh, you know, I always love to talk about this with editors, especially for folks that I know that are deep into editing and you do a lot of stuff for false staff books. You do a lot of stuff from uh, Mocha press uh, and Mocha memoirs press. Uh, and I, I'm wondering how much does editing make you a better writer? Do you feel like that, that the two kind of have a kismet that, that you looking at other people's stuff and going through it, do you feel like you, you automatically become a better writer doing that kind of thing? Or is that, what is the appeal to you about editing other people's work? Um, the money. <laughs> no, um, no, uh, I, I like, I, I, I do think that editing, um, my editing brain helps me to turn in very clean copy mm. because I have had editors tell me before that, that they didn't have to do a whole lot of work on what I sent in. And, yeah. and that's, that's a lovely feeling to have an editor say, yeah, you know, it's not going to take you long to revise this because there weren't a whole lot of major changes you needed. Um, and that's something feeling that, I'll never know, by the way. But. <laughs> well, and it took me a long time to get there when, when Mad Kestrel, Mad Kestrel was originally published by Tor in New York. And uh, when I turned in the first, uh, the, the first uh, manuscript for it, um, they came back and they said, we love this. Now here's everything we want you to rewrite. 
And I went to pieces and I sat in my, my living room and cried for an entire day practically because it was all so many things. And I thought, I can't do all this. This is crazy. And then I sucked it up and I rewrote and um, sent it back in. And a few weeks later, Dennis writes me, Dennis was my, the, the editor's assistant who was helping mm -hmm. out and who was working with me. And Dennis wrote back and he said, oh, Missy, this is so much better. Thank you. Now, here's just one more and sent me the manuscript back and it was half again as much. And I thought, really, really? And I cried again, but, um, but then I did the revisions and sent it back in. And finally that, that time was good. So I have had to learn just like everybody else does how, how to, um, how to craft a book, how to, how to construct it and how to write in a way that's going to make an editor not want to revise a whole lot in what I've, in what I've turned in. Um, and that, uh, that has, you know, that editing brain of mine has taught me that, but um, it also, I, I really like editing for other people because I want to see other people enjoy that same thrill that I've mm -hmm. been able to enjoy of seeing my name on a book and, and having people come up and say, oh, I read your book and it was so good. I want other people to feel that too, because it's, it's really thrilling. And so when I edit, I don't, I'm not easy on people. I, I don't pat you on the head and go, well, you know, that's fine. I am hard on people because I feel like holding writers to a higher standard, uh, it rewards everybody. It rewards the writer because they end up putting out the best possible book they can. Mm. And that way the world doesn't see all the the weird stuff that, that, that needed fixing before the world only sees the brilliance at the end, but then it also, it also rewards the reader because the reader is then taking in a, 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 a story that is, that is so good that they can get completely immersed and they're not, they're not going, yeah, I'll read some more later. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll pick it up tomorrow. They're, they're going, okay, it's 1230 and I have to work at, I have to get up for work at six, but I just want to finish one more chapter. And that's what you want. So when I'm editing for somebody, that's what I want them. That's what I want their book to do for readers. And so that's why I'm, I'm not easy on them. I'm, I'm not mean, but, but I'm, I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. So. Do you, are you somebody who edits as they write or do you are able to turn that off and just write and then go back and edit? I can, I wish, oh, I have friends who can just vomit 200 pages out in no time at all. And they're like, oh, I've written another book. And I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> I can't do that. I wish I could, but I edit as I go. And so, you know, so yeah, it's a very clean copy. It took six months, but, <laughs> or longer, but uh, yeah, I, I can't, I wish I could. That seems like a lovely skill to have. I'm jealous. I'm wondering if you'll indulge me and, and give me a sense of, because as somebody who also goes through a lot of these pains and <laughs> these ills, uh, what is the thing that you think about the most as, a, as your editor brain when you're writing? What do, what do you look, is it crutch words? Is it something you're thinking about that you know you're, you're, you do, but, you're, but your editor and your editor brain is looking for it? It does is that something and it does it get in your way when you're writing um i do have crutch words and uh at this point um i generally feel them when when i've typed one and i can mm. usually go back pretty quickly and and uh and occasionally it's a word that i can keep if because that's the thing about crutch words. They're fine if you've used them in moderation. Yeah. It's they're only a crutch word when you've used them on every page. Yeah. So, um, so I'll have to go back and make sure, Oh, is that one okay there? Yeah, that's fine there. But um, I do watch out for my crutch words. Um, I think um, my, my biggest problem is I know I, I see it in my head. I see it like a movie. Yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of writers don't, but that is how I do. And I'm, so I'm one of those as well. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is going to sound familiar to I to you. I bet. Um, because I see it as a movie, it's moving much faster in my head than I can get <laughs> words down on the page. Yeah. And so I will write a scene too fast, and and then I'll look back and go. Mm, 
Oh, I, I got to add <laughs> stuff to this because this is this was over way too fast. This needed to be 10 mm -hmm. pages long and it's only two. And uh, so that is my biggest hassle, I think, uh, as far as um, as things that I do a lot. Um, I do tend to write things too fast. And mm -hmm. but but I do I can I can see it, too. When I go back and look, I, I can immediately say, oh, this was just terrible. I need to add to this. And so I'll just sit down and add to it. Yeah, I totally relate to all that. I okay. and coming from a screenwriter background too, it's even worse for me because I'm trained to do that. I'm trained to take all the extraneous things out of out of what I'm trying to write and realize that I'm now writing a novel and I need those things to make sense for <laughs> the person trying to actually look at it and read it. And and uh, and so I always have to go back and fill in a lot of extraneous details or th little things that I didn't think would be matter matter because my brain shuts those off when I'm just trying to get to the point. And, right. and so I'm, I do, I tend, and it's funny because now that I've, I've, I've become much stronger reader in, in my later time and later days and, and reading a lot more, I find that when I go back and read my own stuff and certain things are missing or a sentence doesn't make sense, I go, what the hell was I doing? I don't even know. <laughs> you know, so, so that that's that's coming up a lot in this particular uh, novella that I've been working on, and, and and it's very interesting to me because I never used to think like that, and it's very, it's very, it, in some ways, I'm very, I'm like, I'm hugging myself because that's an evolution to my writer, a writer personality that I think is very important, but absolutely, but also it's it's an interesting dichotomy because I do still go back and write screenplays and still write movies. And, uh, and I wonder if that makes me a better screenwriter because I can see it clearer because I know how to write it better, you know, but I don't know. I think everything we write, every time we write something it, that improves us as a whole, mm -hmm. um, whether it's something that we end up publishing or not, every time we write something, that's a lesson we're learning and, uh, and a way of improving ourselves. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm jealous. I've always thought it might be fun to try screenwriting, but it's just never something that's been in in my way it's never you know come up and said oh this might be something to try sometime but and i'd still love to one of these days so who knows <laughs> yeah absolutely <So> i'm jealous <laughs> yeah and it's a different type of writing too there's a different muscle you use and a different idea on and a different way to write as well so it's it's very interesting for me to have crossed over and done both now and you know I, i've written novels and and short stories and things of that nature. I actually started in short stories. That's the first thing I ever wrote as a kid, but I think most of us probably did. But it, uh, yeah, so it's just interesting that the, that 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 dichotomy and, and idea. And I, I and I think too something else that I've discovered in looking back because of when I wrote my first novel, I only intended it to be a standalone novel, right? So I just wanted to write that and get that out of me. And then people started to go, well, you kind of left it on this this note. Is there <laughs> going to be a second one, right? And then I go, okay, well, okay. So then through the urging of my publisher at the time and through the urging of the, the few fans I had who were reading this, I ended up writing a second one. And I realized that the second one and first one don't connect as good as they should. So we went back and tried to rewrite the first one and then, or, or you know, add certain elements to kind of connect it to, and that didn't sure. work. I just started rewriting it because I'm such a better writer now than I was when I wrote that book. And it's like, so you know, you create messes for yourself too as writers often too. You know, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> and I'm, you know, and I, I, I say that because not 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 to make this about me, uh, because I do want to lead this into what we're going to talk about next and and something that i mentioned off air and you mentioned that the process in which you've created a certain character in doc holiday has kind of you wrote a bunch of stuff early on but john wanted to wait because it's part of his 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 universe he wanted to wait to get a bundle together to to put out there and so are you looking back at that, having written something like that a while ago and now, you know, trancing into the, the end of it, 
is there is there you feel there's a difference too do you because you are a different writer at that point is there something that are you going back and kind of needling at the first couple ones that you wrote because of who you are now well actually i did because uh by the time um the uh by the time the third book was was in process and and almost completed uh, the first two had been given back to me for revisions. And so mm -hmm. I was able to look at them and say, okay, this is good and I can tweak this and make it better. Um, the, I think the thing about these is that I've, I've really come to know my character so much better by the third book than I did in the first two. In the first two, I was still finding out who he is because uh, because yes, it is Doc Holliday, but he has, it's four years after he died mm. and he's been brought back for a specific purpose. Of course. Of by course. That's, <laughs> that's so hardness. That is such a hardness thing right there. That is so fall staff right there. Yeah, exactly. It, <laughs> it takes place in the Shadow Council universe. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so he's been brought back for a specific purpose by a specific character. And uh, he, and he's, he's told that his original death was not actually his fated death. It was not the death that he was supposed to, to experience. Mm. And because of that, she was able to bring him back. And because of that, he can't die until the death that is fated for him comes to him. And she, but she won't tell, tell him, him what that is. She right? won't know. <laughs> she won't tell him what it is. And um, and so he's constantly thinking about, do yeah, I want to know? Is. Or maybe I don't want to know. Or maybe she doesn't really know. Maybe she's just saying that to keep me on the hook. And and um, so it's it's been a lot of fun writing him and learning who he is because he's essentially a new person. He's, mm. he's Doc Holliday. Yes. But, but nobody knows that he's Doc Holliday except a very few people because he can't go around to, to people in, in, um, in Podunk, Oklahoma and say, well, I'm Doc Holliday because then they'd either think he's crazy or they'd hang him for being, uh, yeah. being some sort of a demon or something. And yeah. so he has to keep that quiet. And, uh, and, um, so just a few people know, but they're, you know, they're allowed to know. So um, Plus if you're, if you're going by the lore of doc holiday and what we do know about him, I'm, I'm a big doc holiday guy for everybody out there. So I know quite a bit about him actually. And, okay. and, and, and for people who don't know, you know, he, he pressed a lot of buttons because he was so much, he was so much smarter than everybody else out there. He, he was able to get himself into situations and get himself out of them. With, with just, just, you know, you know, kind of dazzling people, you know, regaling people. He would do like magic tricks to kind of fool people. He would do, you know, he would do, car he, he was a card, sh card shark. He yes. knew how to manipulate cards very well and all those things. And, and he would always use it to his advantage. He was kind of a selfish guy from everything that I've read and, and understood about him. And so it's like, so I'm sure there's a lot of people still who would, even four years after the fact, maybe remember that about him and and be wary of him if he was to tell them he was doc holiday right exactly so. exactly <laughs> and uh i've had a lot of fun with the character too because even though it's four years after he died which means that i don't have to stick to any specific history because he's right. making new history for himself i still try to throw in uh whatever i can find to make him feel like himself and so he'll from time to time wonder how what Wyatt's still up to because yeah. Wyatt's still alive yeah. and uh Kate was also uh big nose Kate is also still alive at this point and he wonders now and then if she's happy you mm -hmm. know where she's living and um and I in the second of the novellas he runs into a demon that's running a, a rigged magical card game and I wanted to base it on Pharaoh so much. Now I, got, so, I definitely got to read this. <laughs> well, I, I didn't end up basing it on Pharaoh because then I, I looked up how to play it and I watched some videos online and that game goes really fast and I couldn't, I couldn't make it work. And so mm. I had to, I had to base it on poker instead, which was fine because poker at that point was not the complicated kind of game that we're used to seeing in Vegas these days. It's yeah. a, it's a much simpler version of, of what it is now. So I could use it, but wow, Pharaoh just, 
you know, when I read, oh, Doc Holliday was a faro dealer, I had no idea of what that really meant. And so that was fun <laughs> finding out what faro, because it's a very fast game mm. it, and, and it doesn't it, it doesn't take a minute to, to play a hand of faro. So so that was really interesting. And I've, I've enjoyed learning stuff like that because, you know, everybody knows the stuff like, oh, he was at the OK Corral and, and yeah. he was Wyatt Earp's secondhand man and all that stuff. But then you there, learn all that thoughts that he stuff. wasn't there. There was the, there there's there's accounts where it says that he may not have actually been there at the time. Wow. Yeah. I haven't run into that. So, but yeah. uh, I mean, there, there's always there's there's a lot of historians who argue the, that perspective of of you know because there's also thoughts that um, that the Virgil died at the OK Corral and didn't survive. And there's, there's, there's all kinds of weird things about the OK Corral, uh, the fight at the OK Corral that uh, are being disputed all the time. It's very interesting. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah I, you know, Doc Holliday is one of those characters too, that um, had such a rich, rich childhood, had a rich life. And it's very interesting that, you know, it's, it's kind of, he's kind of, you know, I know this is going to sound probably bad but he's kind of he's kind of the jesus of the old west because there's a period of of his life that's never talked about like yeah. early on in his life and it's just like he grew up he was already he was already a bad criminal the the first accounts of who he was and people running into him like Wyatt Earp in, in one of his one of his uh, little novellas talks about you know the first time he met him and it was like he was already well into being a an outlaw and a horrible person at that point. And it was like, it's like, nobody knows about the guy who is how he got so intelligent and who he was as a kid. And there's not a lot out there about him. Have you found well, that as well? I, some, although I, I, I found it interesting learning about his brother, the, the adopted oh, yeah. brother. Um, uh -huh. And so I, I made sure and throw that in one of the books as nice. just a little bit of, of uh, flavor, because I thought that was terribly interesting that he had an older adopted brother that uh, his father brought home from the war. And, yeah. um, and they were, they were close. The, the, he and the brother, you know, they liked each other. So, and that's not always true when, when somebody's brought into an established family, um, even though Doc came along later, but, um, but, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's interesting that the, that the family accepted this child, the, the wife accepted this child that her husband brought home. And then he and, and the little brother were, were good friends and close and played together. So, you know, I, I, I enjoyed that little aspect of what I could find. And, uh, there was also something that I read that I found really interesting and I've thrown, I've used this in the, in the books too, that, uh, some historians say that the last words that um, Earp and Holiday shared was um, Holiday insulting Earp's girlfriend, say, call, <laughs> saying something very anti-Semitic because she was yeah. Jewish, yeah. and uh, and that Wyatt pretty much just turned on his heel and walked away. And those were the last words they ever spoke to each other. And I thought I I want to put that in because something that I'm doing with Doc in the story now I'm not trying to be ultra woke or anything, so nobody get excited. But, but I am trying to help him grow and learn how to be a better person mm -hmm. as he goes. And so, um, so at one point I have him think about those last words and wish that he could take them back and, uh, and understand that, that really what he said was, was cruel and not only to the woman, but to, but to Wyatt. And, um, and so, you know, I put that into, and those are the kinds of things that I, Vanessa, I absolutely agree. Um, but those are the kind of things that I think make a character more, more real to, mm. to readers. And so, so I want him to be doc, but I also want him to be my doc. And so, um, so I'm trying to use those little things that I find and uh, make him, make him more well-rounded. And make him become a better person as he's going on in the second chance at life. So, and not just have adventures, <laughs> although they're adventures. <laughs> how, how, how much, how, how, um, how has it been working in a universe that already exists too? I mean, the, you, you were able to create your own universe with the, with, with the Kestrel series, but you're, you are sharing, you're, you're, 
you are sharing aspects to connect the shadow the shadow councils to to your stories so you have to use a little bit of that universe i would suspect uh, at least a little bit i know that john says that you can write off and go do your own thing at some point but i would imagine there had to be a connection there so how was that for you in terms of that versus creating your own world um, it actually worked really well for the reasons that they brought Doc back. It, it made it very, it made his resurrection sensible. And, uh, and because my stories are taking place out in the, in the, uh, the Western part of the, the United States, that's far away from, um, from Quincy Harker's uh, yeah. segment of the of the Shadow Council. So as long as I followed the basic rules that John has set up, and I do have a document that has those in it, and I do check it from time to time. And if I can't find the answer to my question, I will then go to him and go, okay, I need to know about this. And usually he'll say, um, I don't know, do what you want with this. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, I, my, my part of the shadow council is the, is the American Western, um, uh, office basically. And so they're dealing with different kinds of critters and different kinds of, of problems. And they have, they have some slightly different, uh, procedures that they go through that, that maybe the, um, the shadow council in the Quincy Harker books won't necessarily do, but the, but the idea is still the same. And so that was, that's really not a problem at all because I understand what, uh, what the goal is behind the, the organization. And so it fits right into what I'm doing. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. You know, even an hour couldn't contain us. We went over an hour a couple minutes ago. And yeah, we, and we could go on and on, I'm sure, and talk more. Uh, I know. It, it, it's, it, it's been wonderful being able to do this with you, Misty. I really appreciate the opportunity to sit down and talk to you in more detail about your worlds and what you do and how you do it. And, um, you know, pick your brain a little bit about editing and stuff like that. And a little, a little selfishness on my part there, trying to get a little help for my stuff, but I appreciate you indulging me there and, and, and talking about all that as well. It's been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Uh, yeah. I can't, I, I have, a, I have a feeling that you and I are going to speak in long <laughs> terms for a while now and probably in October sit down and talk for quite a bit as well. So I'm really, I would love that. that. I would <laughs> love that. <laughs> and I will definitely come by the table and say hello and, Yay. and hang out. And yeah. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. I appreciate that. And yeah, yeah. I, so thank you so much for 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 doing this and and being a part of this and and, and helping you know kind of bridge the gap between this first part that we've done with the multiverse stuff and into the second part, which will start in August. So I really appreciate the opportunity. So thank you so much, Misty. Oh, thank you. It was a joy. I loved it. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, that's our show tonight, and uh, thank you for joining us. And like I said, this is kind of kind of book ending the first part of what we've been doing here on spotlighting the multiverse. We're going to be back in August going through with a lot more guests and talking about that. And uh, we're all leading up to October for us and the opportunity to be at multiverse, which I hope by now, you know, you all, you know, you hear me say it every time I do this show, if this doesn't do it, I don't know what will, but you got something's got something's got <laughs> to click for you that you have to be at multiverse because you do you have to be there, just like you always know that it's always time to go indie now, and we will see you again in August with this show. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us. <laughs>